But let's try to do uh, an audio question first from uh, Rain uh, Goligio, uh, who is a radio reporter of Prime 105.5 in Monrovia, Liberia. Uh, like you say, I'm Rain Goligio, and I'm from Liberia, Monrovia specifically. And, uh, you know, my question uh, centers around uh, how can this discussion, you know, serve as an impact, especially looking at our region, Africa, as a low-income uh, region, and uh, looking at uh, some of the crises that are being faced by uh, young people, or let's say children that of the society. Uh, how do we think, or how do you really think that uh, this discussion can also serve as an impact to uh, the the region? So it's, it's a very important question because um, the science and the basic concepts and principles of science apply the same everywhere in the world. Um, but the context is kind of where the action is, right? So um, biologically, whether, whether children in rural or urban areas or wealthy or poor or with uh, excesses of resources or the extremes of low resources, um, the body, ch when children are young, the brain and the body are reading the environment and trying to be optimally adaptive to whatever that environment requires. And the question of how you turn that into policies and programs um, doesn't come from scientists. It comes from people living in whatever area you're talking about and looking at, uh, it really relates to something Swati talked about, about the co-creation process. Um, where, where is the political leverage? Um, where is, the, where is the, the will to focus on young children and what resources are available? So there is, there is, there is no situation. I, I, I've been in situations where people talk about living in chronic wars and worrying about what does that mean to children. It means it's a higher level of adversity, but the principles are the same. And it has to be a locally constructed response to use the basic principles of protecting children, supporting relationships, building adult skills, and reducing stress. One question for you, Swati. You mentioned that the, um, at the Yankala school, there is a bit of distrust in the community toward the teachers. Um, could you maybe expand on that again? What, what was the distrust about and why was it different between the small community versus you know, with the acceptance of the teachers in, in the urban setting? I think that um, a lot of, at least in Oregon, and we've had a lot of uh, impact in the rural towns of a lot of the jobs have disappeared, which, you know, logging and there are all sorts of things. You've got these real, these communities that have been really depressed that used to be vibrant, you know, in terms of economic productivity. And so we've got real strains in the community. And essentially what was going on in Yonkala is families felt like the teachers didn't live in the community and were driving in. And it was just a disconnect because some of the parents had been to school in Yonkala and it's multi-generational relationships with the school where adults felt like they didn't have a positive experience. And so there was really a need to listen to the community and listen to take to build more resilience and sturdy relationship between the teachers and the parents. And what's been fascinating is the parent community has shifted the superintendent's thinking to the point where the superintendent, the school board, and this early childhood project became um, a sort of equalizer for the whole community to rally around and rebuild their community around the assets of the community. And I think that one of the things I've always thought about the early childhood space is that the downside is it's a chaotic and not a system side is nobody owns it. And so I think positioning parents to have power in designing that system is what makes sense. Okay, so I wanna ask Swati and then Jack kind of a, a, a twinned questions. Swati, I kind of had you rush uh, through those, that last slide or so. So I, I actually wanna have you expand on that a little bit about the lessons learned in your mind, what, was the, what were the lessons learned that were, that were encouraging and what were the lessons learned that were discouraging? And then after she talks, Jack, I was wondering if you could, if you could give us your sense of you know, what they're doing at the, with the Children's Institute with their, with their programs. From your perspective, you know, um, 
you know, in your mind, what, what do you expect to be working out well? And, and, um, and do you see this in a lot of other states also or other locales? So Swati, if you could go first on that. Sure. Uh, you know, Jack mentioned in the beginning, he alluded to sort of the preschool movement that's happened in the policy space, which we're all behind and uh, advocate for. But we know that that's starting too late and that and it doesn't engage parents or um, really enter the area of comprehensive services that the communities were lifting up as meeting their needs. And so I think as advocates, we sort of assumed in work both these communities, and I want to share the same was true in Yonkala, thinking, well, we're just going to help them get preschool. And that's going to be the first building block. But that wasn't Yonkala's need. Wasn't, they didn't perceive that as their most urgent need. And the Earl Boyle's parents actually were all for, we want preschool. But the truth is those surveys took place and we invited the community to do them, learning what really um, were their core issues, housing, nutrition, um, health. The question is how prepared are we in the professional setting to make the pivot? And what are the tools and skills we have to adapt to the information we're getting as they say, uh, you know, salute the, the solutions to problems are usually close to the source of your experiencing the problem, but our systems aren't created in a way in which to have that co-design. So what I would say from our perspective is we made an enormous shift. Our policy agenda was just birth to five, starting with preschool. In this ground up initiative, it's like you deal with all this stuff. And if families are going to continue to be poor and not be stable, some of the families are living on, you know, $10,000 a year, $7,000 a year. You can't support a family on that. And Jack, do you have any thoughts about what they've been doing in Oregon and what, whether they're doing the same kinds of things in, in other states to some success? Yeah, well, certainly the uh, Swati's organization, the work she's described, is among the models in the country, right? And there's huge variability. For me, the real issue is that the early childhood field has been around for more than half a century. It began in the Great Society War on Poverty programs of Lyndon Johnson's administration. And, and over all of this time, the basic proof of concept has been dealt with over and over again. I mean, are, are, are these outcomes fixed or can we change outcomes as a result of what happens early in life? And there's no question from evaluation research and science that we can change trajectories, no question about that. But what we haven't been able to do is to get to greater impact at a population level, at scale, above and beyond demonstration programs. So I will take Swati's uh, presentation, which was wonderful, and link it to something that, that, um, that we learned early in our process when we were working with model programs, is we were looking to the issue of how do you take programs to scale and how do you, how do you increase their impact? And, when we met with a group of programs that were all considered state-of-the-art, like Swati's, and we said, we'd really love to put a group together to kind of figure out how we ramp up the impact and ramp up scale, who's interested? And they broke down into two groups, people who said, we'd love to be part of this because we have, we have the state-of-the-art and we'd love other people to do that. And there was another subset that said, we'd love to be part of this because we know we're considered to be among the best programs in the state or whatever. But the truth is that every day, every week, we see children and families who are doing fantastically well as a result of what we're doing. And we see some where we feel like we're having very little impact at all. And we'd love to figure out what to do differently. And I think that gets to the issue that there's no kind of one model. I think the co-creation process that Swati talked about is tremendously important. And then we have to link what's important to families and therefore what programs should focus on to um, some understanding of so how is what we're doing relating to that and how are we measuring what the impact is and recognizing that it's not going to work the same for everybody. So I think the challenge in the field is to think about how we come up with a, a diversity of approaches to, a, to, to kind of improve outcomes rather than just look for the demonstration projects. And there's a wealth of knowledge on the part of the families and on the part of the staff who work in programs in institutes like SWATI 
um, that often we're not capitalizing on because the environment is making it very hard for programs to kind of improve and innovate because the environment is saying, show us you're making a difference and we'll support you. If you're not making enough of a difference, we'll take your money away. And so like everything else, people adapt, right? If we applied that to cancer research, think of where we would be, right? We have cancers that are curable. We have cancers that are, have very low survival rates. Nobody asks, how are we doing on cancer treatment? They say, which ones are, su are we successful and which ones are we not? And how do we double down on those where we're not having a big enough impact as opposed to saying, we haven't found a cure yet, so let's give up. And that's, I, I think we need to apply the same to poverty. It's not, it's, it's not about what's the best program. It's about customizing to what the community wants and what the community needs, what the resources are and what the needs are and continuing to plug away to figure out how do we get the best effects for the resources we use. Okay, so thank you on that. So I have a question here. This would be for Jack from Caitlin Nation. She's from Wyoming. Um, I'm just gonna read the question. It's, uh, it's using a few, few uh, concepts I'm not that familiar with, but so I'm sure you will be. Have you looked into the potential of adult neuroplasticity? I know the effects of racial and income disparities are daunting. I'm just curious if anyone has looked into the research on this for potential brain rewiring after trauma experienced in childhood uh, due to trauma, poverty, and other complicating factors. Yeah, great question. Thank you for that question. So plasticity or neuroplasticity, which relates to the brain, for those of you who don't know the term, which is how much adaptability, how much flexibility is there in the brain? Um, and the, and that, that's related to critical and sensitive periods where you have the highest amount of plasticity. So here are the take home messages on that. First of all, there absolutely is adult neuroplasticity. The brain, when the, the brain's ability to adapt continues throughout life. Plasticity ends when you have a flat line and they pull the sheet over you and say, this is really sad, that was a great life. Until you die, your brain has the capacity to adapt. But the challenge is that you have optimal plasticity at the highest level of adaptability at birth. <laughs> and, and that as your brain is built and as the architecture is developed and as the circuits are made, the brain doubles down on things it needs and it prunes away what it doesn't. And so you get less plasticity as you get older, but it never, it just decreases. It doesn't go to zero. So, so the answer here is that it's always better to get things right the first time. You build a strong foundation, you have it for the rest of your life. Um, but if you don't build a strong foundation the first time, then you've got a weaker foundation, but you can work at it. You can always make improvements, but it's harder. It costs more. It's never as good as it would have been if you'd gotten it right the first time. So we should never give up on adult plasticity. What's, what's the proof that it's harder as you're older? So what is it, we're October 1st tomorrow? So a couple of months, it'll be January 1st. Everybody will start making New Year's resolutions. This year, I'm going to eat better and I'm going to exercise more. We are motivated. It's just harder to do it because our patterns are set. But absolutely, neuroplasticity is real. Um, and none of these things in early childhood are overly deterministic. In fact, I'm sorry, but I do want to add one more thing. Sure. The neuroscientists go crazy. They go apoplectic. When people talk about this thing about how 90% of the brain is finished by age three or age four or whatever it is, 75% of the brain is developed. That is so wrong. That's, that, that percentage is based on the size of your brain. Your, your head size doesn't get much bigger after you're about five or six years old. Um, but your brain is nowhere close to being that much completed. It continues to get built and develop over a lifetime. So it's not all or nothing in the early childhood period, but you miss a tremendous opportunity to build a strong foundation when you focus your own. And it's all about plasticity. Okay, well, thank you for that. So we just have a few more minutes. I'd, I'd like to get a question into both of you about this thing called COVID that you may have heard about it this year. Um, I mean, Dr. Shankoff, first of all, how does an episode like COVID, you know, the, the economic stag, stagnation, the isolation, how does that itself affect the brain in, in young children? Um, and what sort of effects would you expect to see down the road from what we've been going through for the last six months? And Sawadi, 
in, you know, what are you seeing from the people, from the children, the families in communities that are part of your programs? Um, what have you seen from them in the last six months? And are your schools, are your schools back right now? I mean, what, what are you seeing uh, in, among the children after they were, you know, out of a school setting for, for you know, however many months it was? I mean, Jack, if maybe you could start. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, you know, I think one of the most unfortunate terms was the person who decided to call this social distancing instead of physical distancing, right? So we all know if we're going to talk about young children, that children develop in an environment of relationships and social connections are critical to healthy development. And as I had said earlier and Swati alluded to, um, the best way to kind of protect the health and the emotional and social development of children is to kind of make sure that the needs of the adults who are caring for them are being addressed when they're very young. And so if we look at this, um, again, I hate to sound like a Johnny one note, but it's tremendous variability, right? So the first question is before COVID started, there were many children living in families who were already struggling at the edge in terms of resources. And so they are clearly as a group, the most vulnerable to kind of significant problems. And then there were families who had more resources, and I don't mean just wealth, but people who had access to resources and social networks and are in a better position on average to get through. So will there be more children who will be seriously harmed from the stresses on their families and the social isolation? Absolutely. Is everyone doomed? Absolutely not. Are there children living in poverty? who will be okay, of course, there are parents living in poverty who do magnificent jobs protecting their children from the stresses. The issue is variability, the issue is age. Think about pre-existing conditions as not just do you have an illness, but what were the pre-existing conditions of the resources and assets that families had to meet their basic needs? And that's gonna be an important predictor. Um, any answer to any question that gives a global response about children are gonna be fine the children going to do poor doesn't understand the tremendous importance of variability. Okay, thanks. And Swati, so, uh, so what, what have you been seeing in your, the schools that you're involved with? Well, there are all sorts of challenges, obviously, for everyone as a result of this. But the first inequity is that schools closed and nobody is wondering whether people have a job or the financial stability, you know, whether we'll have schools in the future. The same is not true for childcare, where you have uh, childcare providers who are already not paid a living wage and the whole financing system. You're gonna talk about that later and you're one of your upcoming programs, but I won't go into it, but this constant inequitable resource uh, reality between early childhood and K-12, it's just laid bare during the pandemic. The other thing I'll say is that what's clear is in a cr an anticipated crisis like we've been in, institutions are slow to react, but people can respond much more quickly. And my tangible example of that is that in Earl Boyles and Yonkala, those community ambassadors and parents who were already mobilized and had a set of relationships could go out and respond and find out what people need and take food and offer books and resources. And you know that happens because people feel safe and cared for in a set of relationships. And so at some point where we just keep looking to institutional responses, and at some point we've got to look at human responses and how we build that set of relationships and resource them so that the sort of trusted community members are in to do what they know how to do best. I want to pile on what Swati just said. The most, the people, the young children and families we should worry most about are those who pre-COVID were already socially isolated, were socially disconnected and invisible, and they become even more invisible now. That's, that, that is clearly the area of greatest need. And there's no question that the social supports that people provide for each other generally and through these really tough times are the critical kind of game changers. One final question coming in from Marguerite Herman. Is there a role for breastfeeding in this? I mean, what's the, what's the connection between breastfeeding and brain development and early childhood development? So a quick question. Um, breastfeeding is, is very important and wonderful and optimal nutrition for children, um, young children. Um, 
mothers who cannot breastfeed should not feel that their children are at risk for problems in life. Uh, um, breastfeeding is, um, I mean, what can I say? Breast, breastfeeding is very important and it's wonderful. Um, but, um, and it, it should be the preferred method of nutrition uh, when possible, but it's not always possible for everyone and people who cannot breastfeed for one reason or the other um, should not be stigmatized and made to feel like they're doing harm to their children. But should we be neutral about breastfeeding? No, it's absolutely the preferred method of feeding, but a lot of healthy people were not breastfed. I, some people might be unhappy with what I just said, but you, you can sense from my answers. This is anything that says this is the thing that works for everybody all the time is kind of really on very thin scientific ground. 